Ripped from the tapestry of history, this is Threads of the War, personal, truth-inspired flash fiction of the 20th century's war. I'm Jeremy Strozer. Surrounded. Here they come again! Strained words project from the dark ridge line as at least two battalions of North Korean infantry storm up toward my platoon. My voice is cracking, as are my men. We've been holding a forward perimeter just south of the main peak of Hill 931, ahead of the rest of C Company since our battalion's attack stalled early this morning. Instead of sending reinforcements, battalion told us to stay put. We volunteered to hold the front. Now, even with support from artillery, mortar, and heavy machine guns, we're about to be overwhelmed. Stay low and fire, I order, hoping my guys stay out of the crossfire between the rest of our battalion and the oncoming red tide. Lieutenant, we can pull back, Sanchez, my radio man, yells toward me. God bless. Battalion must have realized our position is untenable. How nice of them. All right, we're pulling out, I yell to the men. First squad, I'll stay with you. Spread out and cover the rest of the company. Everyone else, pull back. As my hands fumble with a belt of ammunition from our light machine gun, I order Sanchez, leave the set, I'll need it. He climbs out of the harness while moving the Motorola behind a rock. At least most of the boys will be able to rejoin the battalion. Men start running back toward the line, leaving first squad and me out in front of the whole unit. Keep firing, then move! I yell, hoping to stave off a wholesale sprint by most of my men. Cover fire! Maintain cover fire! I scream as I tap the light machine gun twice to signal to Perez it's loaded. Before I can even take my hand off the device, it's already heating up from projected rounds spewing forth toward the reds. Tracer rounds streaking overhead keep me low as I move toward the Motorola. We need more artillery support. This is C Company. We need more fire support. Now! I yell in the device, fingers trembling on the speak button. There's too many of them! Napier yells from somewhere in front of me. We're going to be slaughtered out here if we wait any longer. First squad! Everyone back to battalion! I order in the loudest voice I can muster. I can't let these boys die out here while the rest of the unit is on the ridge. Thomas starts heading back, followed by Richards. Then Wallace and Zappa pop up from an outcrop. Where's Palilla Ao, my bar carrier? Palilla Ao, get back! I call out, not knowing exactly where he is after so much movement to cover the whole position by just a few men. I'll stay, Lieutenant! I hear from in front of a rock outcrop about ten meters from me. I said everyone! I yell back. You'll need cover, Lieutenant! He replies, fire still coming from his position. I can order him to get out of here, but he's right. I do need cover. Just 20 meters ahead of my position, massive explosions burst as our artillery finally shows up. Despite this onslaught of explosives and shrapnel, I can see reds advancing through it, limbs flying, bodies flung about, yet they continue up the hill. Use what ammo you have, then get out of here, I order. Back on the motor roller, I scream above the din. Put everything on us! They're still coming! The staccato firing of the Browning automatic rifle reassures me that Pilalao is still out there as I look over the rocks toward the ever-advancing North Koreans. Some must have seen me as rock splinters shoot out in every direction, inches from my shoulder. I've got to move. Sliding away from my rock, I take the motor roller with me to find another safe perch from which to call in artillery. Looking right and left, I'm lost in time for a moment. I cannot see beyond the small black-filled night, interrupted intermittently with tracer rounds, and finally the bright burst of explosive shells as artillery is plowed over our position. Finding a rock about 15 feet from my original position, I hide behind it to catch my breath. I haven't heard Pillalao since the last burst of artillery. You still there? I yell, not knowing in which direction I should be calling to him. Yes, Lieutenant! We're running low on ammo for the bar! He replies from somewhere in front of me. I can't make it out in the darkness. Pull back, now! I order in the darkness. More artillery bursts, like lightning, with the accompanying crash of thunder as round after round lands among the onrushing red tide. Bullets again start streaking near me. Tracer rounds as long and white, perfectly straight lines streak across the night, shattering rock near my head. Shit, I've got to move again. I'm moving again! Get out! I scream into the ether as I run back toward where I think the rest of the unit is holding the line. During my ascent up the slope, an unstoppable crescendo of rounds, striking rocks and dirt streams forth from all directions. Both sides must be shooting at me. Just 20 meters away from where I think our line is, the dark outline of a dug-in soldier is illuminated by the tracer rounds following me up the slope. This is Lieutenant Hager! Don't shoot! I scream in an almost failing voice, hoping my guys can hear me above explosive artillery rounds landing nearby. Get here! Someone yells from in front of me. Yes, they've heard me. Has Pulalao gotten back yet? I ask to no one in particular as I jump into the dugout. Lieutenant, he's not only not come back, but look! 
Zopa replies, pointing back out toward where the artillery is bursting. By the light of the explosive rounds, I can make out a single man throwing grenades toward the onrushing Koreans. Damn it! He didn't get out of there! Give him cover, boys! I order, not knowing how many men heard me. Flashes of artillery keep his silhouette visible as we fire all around him, from just in front, behind, and to his sides. I can see the Korean soldiers thronging, thrusting, and thrashing at him. Within reach lays an unused rifle, so I pick it up. Fire all around him! Firing tirelessly to his left, I see him pick up a rock to throw. He's out of ammo and grenades. Keep firing! Pulalau pulls out his trench knife and lunges at a Korean soldier as a new set of explosive rounds lights up the whole face of the hill. Revealed by the explosion, a mass of Korean soldiers flows like a wave toward us, except in the area where Pulalau's fighting them off tooth and nail as an island in a sea. His silhouette crumples as if hit by a bullet in the midsection. He's down. Then the mass of Koreans continues forth over where he was fighting. Another round of bright explosive bursts reveals a Korean standing over something, bayonet in hand, stabbing toward the ground. He's gone. On September 17, 1951, Company C, 1st Battalion, 23rd Infantry Regiment, 2nd United States Infantry Division was ordered to take Hill 931 near Piari, Korea. After the attack stalled at the ridgeline south of Hill 931 and north of Hill 854, a platoon of Company C was ordered to hold a forward position while the rest of the company rejoined the main body behind the ridge. At around 10 p.m., two battalions of the 13th Infantry Regiment, 6th Division, Korean People's Army, began a concerted attack on the American position. The North Korean attack overwhelmed this small force, compelling them to retreat to rejoin the company. Private First Class Herbert Kalilea Pilalao's squad was assigned to stay back momentarily and cover the retreat. Eventually, only Pilalao and his squad leader remained at the platoon's original position. The squad leader and forward observer, Lieutenant Richard Hager, called in artillery fire continuously ahead of Pilalao, trying to cover him while he moved, also calling fire on two hilltops, while Pilalao continued to fight off the attack. At one point, Hager became afraid that the artillery was too close and that he hit Pillalau. Hager called out for him and Pillalau said he was okay and told Hager to keep going. After exhausting the ammunition for his bar, Pillalau began throwing hand grenades until those two were gone. As some of his comrades watched from their new position further down the ridge, Pillalau threw rocks at the attackers before charging at them, wielding his trench knife with one hand and punching with the other. He was soon surrounded and killed by bayonet. When his platoon retook the position the next day, they found 40 dead North Korean soldiers around his body. A native Hawaiian who was born and raised on the island of Oahu, Pilalau was a talented singer and ukulele player and an avid reader. Drafted into the army, he briefly considered declaring himself a conscientious objector, as his Christian faith made him unsure of killing others, but decided against this idea. He was sent to Korea in March 1951. Aged 22 at his death, Pillalau was buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific in Honolulu on February 26, 1952, Section P, Grave 127. For his actions on what would later become known as Heartbreak Ridge, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. I'm going to read the Medal of Honor citation. Private First Class Pillalau, a member of Company C, distinguished himself by conspicuous gallantry and outstanding courage above and beyond the call of duty in action against the enemy. The enemy sent wave after wave of fanatical troops against his platoon, which held a key terrain feature on Heartbreak Ridge. Valiantly defending its position, the unit repulsed each attack until ammunition became practically exhausted and it was ordered to withdraw to a new position. Voluntarily remaining behind to cover the withdrawal, Private First Class Pillalau fired his automatic weapon into the ranks of the assailants, threw all his grenades, and with ammunition exhausted, closed with the foe in hand-to-hand -hand combat, courageously fighting with his trench knife and bare fists until finally overcome and mortally wounded. When the position was subsequently retaken, more than 40 enemy dead were counted in the area he had so valiantly defended. His heroic devotion to duty, indomitable fighting spirit, and gallant self-sacrifice reflect the highest credit upon himself, the infantry, and the United States Army. If you enjoy these threads of personal experience and more, please consider becoming a patron of this work at patreon.com forward slash threads of the war. You may find my books and other work at jeremystrozer.com or wherever books are sold. If you are interested in turning notes, memories, or memoirs of a relative into a living history through such work, please reach out to me at jeremy at jeremystrozer.com. 
May the lessons of history compel the world toward peace. Thank you.